Hi, welcome to our interview show in which we interview LGBTQ guests who are important contributors to our community. We want to acknowledge that All Things LGBTQ is produced at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which is unceded Indigenous land. Enjoy the show. Buddy, I'd like to introduce Sharon Thompson to our show, All Things LGBTQ. How are you, Sharon? I'm doing great. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to have you. I've been looking forward for this for a while. Um, Sharon, I just want to tell you, is a writer, editor, and co-founder of Lesbian Home Movie Project. She co-edited Powers of Desire, The Politics of Sexuality, and wrote Going All the Way, Teenage Girls, Tales of Sex, Romance, and Pregnancy. Her articles and stories have appeared in an eclectic range of publications from Cosmopolitan to Heresies and Feminist Studies. She grew up in Akron, Ohio. She attended Carnegie Tech and Columbia University and lived in New York East Village for many years. In the early 2000s, she moved to Hancock County, Maine, where she co-founded Lesbian Home Movie Project, LHMP, with B. Ruby Rich and Kate Hornsfield. Lesbian Home Movie Project is a nonprofit corporation that collects, preserves, and documents home movies and amateur films and videotapes shot by or depicting lesbian lives. The archive's earliest collection was shot by Ruth Storm, 1988 to 1981, 1888. <laughs> to 1981. It currently holds over 400 films and videotapes. videotapes. Well, I'm, I'm very impressed. Um, so how did you decide to do this? Did you happen to have a few or you, you just thought, wow, this would be a great project? It, most of my work is feminist work and lesbian work has been kind of serendipity. And this project began when an acquaintance from New York came up to Maine because she had inherited the cabin of a friend of her mother's who she knew was a lesbian. And, and that woman's last lover had been Ruth Storm who shot our earliest collection. And the films were, it, it was a little complicated, but ultimately the films had all been in the cabin. Ruth Storm had been a school teacher in New York she had retired to Maine, where she'd visited many times with her last lover, and she'd edited, slightly edited the films. So they were all there, and we all loved them, everyone who came up. Um, and I started showing them to other friends, not thinking that there would be more footage, thinking that this was really rare. It was an extraordinary thing to be able to see. Um, and the friends started saying, well, I have film or, you know, Susie has film. And um, so then we realized that although the LGBTQ archives and, and standard archives all across the country had virtually no lesbian film, that it might be out there and that it needed to be retrieved and identified or it would just be thrown out or some confusing reel of film at a yard sale. And the whole social milieus that they came from, the histories, the personal histories would be lost. So then we set ourselves up as a project just to do that, to collect as much of that footage as we could find. And we found over 400 pieces so far. Um, and I know there's a lot more out there. So we're really hoping uh, to find it before the people who understand what it is have have died. Um, and you can restore most work, right? Even if it's yes, and actually, the earlier the better, because film lasts better than videotape. Um, and in the north, we found more in the north, although we found a lot of videotape in the south, um, because the northern climate is better for film. Um, so Ruth Storm's films were 16 millimeter from the 1930s through the 1960s. Um, and they were just in a cabin that sometimes when, when they weren't there was, was minus 20 degrees. But they're, you'll see, they're beautiful. 
Okay. And in them, uh, lesbians from Korea, Maine, and other parts of Maine, and from New York, uh, gather and have fun. And uh, the little clip that we're going to see um, shows, it, it appears to be Ruth trying to set up shots that depict moments in her life or in their lives. So there's a moment when she passes a book to an older woman. And we know because we have, we've seen the book, that she did, she herself did give books and inscribe them to students of hers and to lovers of hers. Um, so it's, it's a shot from her own life that she has had reenacted. Um, and other people in the footage, I'll, I'll, um, I'll identify them a little bit more after you've seen them, but, but we know a lot about them. And one was a writer, sculptor, and violinist. They're, they're fascinating. That's amazing. So shall we watch clip one, Ruth Storm? Let's watch it, 1938. <laughs> okay. Well, that was a really good clip. I mean, it's amazing. And what a great thing you're doing here. And let's put out the call that anybody who has these um, film uh, to please get in touch with Sharon. We will have her website up so that if anybody needs to reach her, they can. Great. Um, okay. So the book um, and the and the people there. So who was the who was the uh, the artist and violinist in this? That that her name. It's a somewhat invented name. Was Chenoweth Hall or okay. Chenny Hall? Um, she, uh, she's the woman who climbs the ladder um, uh, in the clip and then also is on the rocks when the taller woman comes over and, and to join her. And the taller woman is the filmmaker, Ruth Storm. She appears to be directing somebody as to how to shoot the shot. So my guess is she had the camera on a tripod and another of her friends was behind the camera. Maybe a woman named, um, uh, a Griffin um, or uh, possibly Miriam Colwell. Miriam Colwell was a local Mainer. She grew up there and she and Chenoweth Hall they became partners and lovers and they remained uh, uh, partners for, their, for the rest of their lives. And are some of the, are there books from this clip the, from the people who wrote it or is this, is that from another clip? Um, it's not in the clip. But no, I sent, I well, I think you're, I said, well, I can, this is a book by Chenoweth Hall, The Crow and the Spruce. Yeah. Um, and this is a book by a friend of theirs who's not in the clip, a Ruth Moore, who's a very well-known um, woman writer from Maine. Um, this is a book by her partner, Eleanor Mayo, another Maine writer. And this is a book by Marguerite Yorsenar, who received the, was the first woman to be accepted into the uh, Academy Francaise. She lived in Northeast Harbor. She saw some artwork by Chenoweth Hall at the local library. And she and her partner, Grace Frick, rented a car and drove from Northeast Harbor to Korea, Maine, which involves going all the way down in, to Ellsworth and then back up the other side and just knocked on their door um, wow. to introduce themselves. Um, um, all lesbians and all uh, just, you know, so filled with creativity and with conviviality. And it's amazing they found each other in Maine, you know, which is fairly rural, I would think, especially back then. Um, it would have been much more rural, rural than it is now. Yes, and how they recognized each other, that's a little mysterious. <laughs> um, uh, a little bit of word of mouth or maybe the content of, you know, whatever they were looking at, but yeah, that's amazing. Well, and also they were traveling in pairs. So, you know, when one woman, female couple um, came upon another female couple who was, you know, making some kind of presentation or then they, they just thought, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think we still do that a little bit today, but probably not as much as back then. Um, so we have a second clip 
which is Janice, is it Gail Perry? And you want to tell us about this clip? Sure. Well, first, Janice Gail Perry is a lifelong Vermonter. Um, she's a performance artist, an internationally known performance artist, but she's also won several uh, Vermont Arts Council awards. Um, and uh, NEA awards that are associated with the Vermont Arts Council. And uh, she um, became friends with a woman who, Karen McCourtney, and, uh, uh, and became partners with her for a certain amount of time. And she had not done, she'd done kind of casual performances in bars and women's uh, gatherings. But when she met Karen, um, Karen set up her first feminist performance, um, which is what she then went on to do. So this is early on in their relationship. They are traveling through Baltimore, and um, and uh, uh, you'll see they're just they're just playful and. Um, and Janice took some of the footage. Karen believed in passing the camera around. So the kind of a uh, wonderful feminist um, film principle. So uh, some of the footage is going to be blurry. Whoever was behind the camera wasn't that good. But Janice took wonderful pictures of Karen, and Karen took some wonderful pictures of Janice, and you'll see. Okay, let's watch the clip. Wow, that's incredible. I'm just like amazed that this is even possible. Um, well, it's a, that is quite amazing. That was 1978, which was post Lavender Menace. But to be going through places like Baltimore, or there's some footage from Belfast, Maine, and just kind of being so open and so clearly, you know, it's not romantic footage, although there is some romantic footage in in the Karen McCourtney's, but um, the the affection and the you know just the liking that they had for each other is so apparent nothing of the is being hidden and we don't that's that's not the way uh queer people today think of lesbian feminists and it's not um and it, it's not the kind of historical reading of times before we had real rights but you can you you can feel you can feel the freedom to come in the way they felt about themselves and yeah. it makes me very happy. I love to watch that footage. <laughs> and also Janice is hilarious in the Batman costume with the glockenspiel. <laughs> Do you did you find anything from like the Cape in Massachusetts? I know there was a huge lesbian artist and um, community in in on the Cape in Provincetown. Lesbians, a lot of lesbians were there. I was wondering if there's any there that haven't been uncovered yet or well, I'm sure there is some that hasn't been uncovered, but we do have a wonderful collection shot by Janet uh, Perlman. Um, and she shot in New York and she shot on the Cape and she shot and, um, uh, and she shot from when she was still in high school um, into her years in New York. And, um, and, it, and there's some Cuban footage too. And that's, that's quite amazing, but I'm sure there is more on the, on the Cape. There's a split between, it's a kind of class split, but it's not exactly a class split. And it's partly a historical split between women who, when they got behind a camera, felt that they were artists. They were on their way to being artists and professional filmmakers. And women who just didn't feel entitled in that way. And what we're collecting is kind of the footage of women who didn't recognize, I would say, I don't think they recognized how good they were uh, mm -hmm. and how important what they were shooting was. And they didn't feel that they could, you know, um, go to HBO or go to MGM. Uh, and, and that that would been very difficult in any case. So they shot for themselves and their friends. Um, and that's that that differentiates this footage. Janet and Janet is one of those people. She 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 could have been a professional. She studied editing, um, but she never quite, you know, made that extra step. And she had other things to do. She was a, 
a librarian and an archivist and, you know, had her own career. Yeah. And so if people wanted to see these clips or they wanted to use them, um, they would go through you and ask permission and get and get the films if they wanted to use them for, I don't know, an educational project or for any right. other. Okay. There's um, some of the footage is on www.lesbianhomemovieproject.org. And that's footage that the, we're very careful with the filmmakers and the videographers. They have to give permission if they, um, for any use. And different filmmakers and videographers feel different kinds of limitations about that. Um, we just licensed some footage that a um, a, a coach, Lorraine Sumner, uh, shot. Uh, she was a lesbian mother who um, had a, a hard time, but she put together a living through lots of physical education, teaching, and coaching jobs. And she was also a semi-professional softball player. And she, uh, and so we have her footage and we just licensed some of it with her permission to the queer director, Tom Kalin. Um, but it's very important to us that the filmmakers get credit. Um, we really push for that. I feel that many of this, a lot of this footage is of, uh, you know, a very high quality and they did something great when they filmed their friends. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, so that's one of the requirements. Sometimes there's other requirements. Um, uh, uh, but they're yeah. not alive anymore. I mean, I'm sure many of these are, people aren't alive anymore. So it would be the person who originally gave you the film? Well, some of them have been surprisingly long lived, like me. <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, uh, and that is, that's an interesting point because that's an assumption. A lot of young students and film students find the footage that we have online and they decide that these women are so dead, old that they must be dead and, and that they have just found the film like it was on a beach. <laughs> and they, they, there's a little bit of an inclination to take it, re-edit it into something and, and claim it's something else. And then often they make very beautiful little films doing that, but it's not what we want. Uh, we really want these events and these filmmakers and videographers to be recognized for their work. Um, so we're careful about that. That's good. And I could see that happening, you know, people just downloading them and doing whatever they wanted. And um, so what is the upper year that you're looking? I mean, like anything before 1980 or before 1970, or you don't really. Um... Before digital. And a lot of our footage was shot by cameras that were out of date when it was shot. Um, the Karen McCourtney collection, she bought that her camera, her Super 8 camera in a pawn shop. So it had already been retired from whoever had made films with it first. Um, and that out of syncness is one interesting aspect of, of the work. Um, but once something is digitized, um, that's a kind of another ballpark. So, and we're, we're involved in saving footage that um, probably won't be saved otherwise. And I want to say that we pay for it. We don't charge. We share rights during a filmmaker or a videographer's lifetime. We accept all kinds of limitations on who can see it or when it will be shown. Um, and because it's all about saving the footage and saving the history so, so it won't get lost in time. Um, yeah. And with them, we return to the uh, film donors of digital copies so they can often they're getting to see something that they haven't been able to view for 20 30 years um and if they're if everybody's lucky and the friends are still around everybody can get together again and yeah laugh over old times <laughs> well really thank you so much Sharon for being on the show this is just an exciting project and um so worthwhile to be saving all of this beautiful footage. So thank you very much. And anybody out there, come on, see Sharon, hand over your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we only ask that you help us understand what it is. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> so thank, thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your work as well. And we'll see you soon and we'll talk again. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. I would like to start this interview with a quote, and it's from Robert Frost. The afternoon knows what the morning never suspected. And that was a quote that was used by today's guest when he wrote an article about LGBTQ seniors. So please welcome from the Fenway LGBTQ Aging Project, their assistant director, Bob Linscott. Welcome, Bob. Thank you, great to be here. Thanks for asking me. Oh, I, I am so glad you could join us. And as I shared with you prior to our starting taping, in Vermont, we're having a growing conversation about what it might mean for LGBTQ Vermonters to age in place. Mm -hmm. But I think I want to start with the article you wrote was in 2014. So you've been working with elders for a while now. I started in 2006, actually. Yeah. Was that at the Fenway as well? We The, uh, the, the aging project uh, moved over to the Fenway, merged with the Fenway in 2013. But we were before that, um, our own organization and we were housed at ethos which is one of the aging service access points in boston okay um, so and, and, would you tell say, and, and prior to that uh i had been very much involved with lgbtq youth through the whole gsa movement and uh and with the uh had been on the board of the organization quiz and gay lesbian straight educators network so i've, I've gone Full, full span here. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, you, you're hitting both ends of the spectrum. Oh, yeah. So yeah. you mentioned it being an independent project that then merged with the Fenway. Could you yeah. tell us a little bit about who the Fenway is? Because not everyone in Vermont may be familiar with them. And what prompted you to merge services? So we, so the Fenway Health is a federally qualified health center. And our specialty is the, the health and well being for lesbian, bi, lesbian, bi, gay, uh, transgender, um, uh, intersex, you know, the whole LGBTQIA community um, and, and the people that are in our neighborhoods. Uh, so their mission is all about not only about health, it's not only about health, but advocacy and policy work and research. So they've been leading, I mean, they've, they've been involved with the whole, the, since the beginning of the AIDS crisis and, and now working with PrEP and all of this and, uh, and, and working towards vaccine and, and um, a tremendous amount of, of policy work as well. And so my, the, the LGBT aging project came on board when they really wanted to, Fenway's commitment is so deep that they wanted to look at the whole entire lifespan. And so they, right about the time we came in, they also took in the Sydney Borum uh, health center, which is mostly focused on youth, uh, LGBTQ youth, uh, and 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 even even younger than that, because Fenway is very much supportive of um, you know uh, family planning and 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 insemination and all that. So uh, so they, we're the full lifespan. So they've got from from the from children all the way to our older adults. So that's so that's how we came in and our we nestled right right well very well into the education division so we're in the fenway institute which is the research and policy division and that's right what we do because the lgbt aging project and we uh we often call it like the three legs of the stool one of the legs is uh, is education and training and so our mission is to make all the elder service organizations Make to make sure that they are culturally competent, so they can know to reach out and be welcoming and inclusive to LGBT older adults. There's no need to reinvent the wheel and create this separate program, you know, separate aging program for just LGBT elders. Because here in Massachusetts, our aging service network is, is excellent. It's really it's it's quite good. So why can't why don't we just go and make the existing network inclusive and welcoming? So. So, so that's so much. Of what, so we'll get in and we'll do trainings with these aging service access points, like where we had been with senior centers, with councils on aging, 
Um, and then we will also do work in terms of, of policy for ourselves to make look, you know, what are some of the policies out there? And for an example of that right now, we have the first in the nation um, LGBT aging commission at the state level. So we are really deeply looking. So we've got representatives from all aspects of the government on the commission looking at uh, you know, health and wellness and medicine and, and um, public health and, and senior centers and senior living and you know, all of this and housing. So that's in policy. And then also the third area is um, in terms of, of you know, community. So we, we really do actively work to make sure that we are helping LGBT older adults themselves support community and create community programs and social groups and things like that. And if my research is correct, the Fenway sponsored three community forums, one in Boston, one on the Cape, and one in Pittsfield, meeting with LGBTQ plus elders to say, okay, what do we need to hear? What, what are the issues that are confronting you? Right. What kinds of things did you learn? What is it that the elders shared with you saying, this is what we need for services? Uh, I the, the what you're talking about, we did at the very beginning of the commission, as we all the commissioners were gathering and doing the research about what 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 are the issues, the current issues for facing LGBT older adults all across the state. We went around in, in a number at the beginning, we went to, oh gosh, we maybe five or six of these listening sessions all around the state. Um, and then we did later mid midway through, we've, we've circled back again after a number of years. We, and we did those three down in the Cape and in the Berkshires and in Boston, um, I think I'll, there are lots of different issues, and and I I, I think that probably that the you will relate to exactly where you are in Vermont. Housing was probably one of the biggest ones because as older adults, LGBT older adults, get to a certain age, there there's a huge fear that raises in there about oh my God, what if I have to go into an assisted living or a nursing home, and how will I be treated, and is it going to be a homophobic environment? Um, so the housing was one of the biggest I issues there but uh, another one is just accessing programs and, and services and exactly what you were saying is the issues in, in vermont is people do not want to feel that they have to drive all the way into boston to connect with other people as you age that's not possible anymore um either transportation transportation mobility the all, there are just too many factors that make it challenging for for people to drive come into a city and park and things like that so so you know those are those are a couple of the a couple of the of, of the bigger ones and and i had read that one of the things unique about our communities is that we tend to age alone yeah and have more physical mental health issues related to lack of access to healthcare and services and that sense of isolation. Now, I understand that the Fenway got a grant from the Eastern Bank Charitable Foundation and you were using it to improve or, or make technology more accessible to your elders to help reduce that sense of, of isolation? Yeah, I'm not sure which grant that 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 one is. Is that the one recently during COVID? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've actually what our response to COVID and it, it's 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 been, and I think we're we're no different than anyone else. Like everyone had to reinvent the wheel uh, overnight and and start from scratch because we have worked so hard over the last nearly two decades creating all of these programs. We've got. You know, we've got a, um, where did I, where'd I put my meal site calendar? It's like, I don't know where it is now, but we've got these, these amazing uh, meal programs, LGBT friendly community meal programs. We have 24 of them all across the state. So these are like congregate meals for LGBT older adults. We've got those happening in all these different corners of the, of the state. We've got um, different, we've got lifelong learning organizations for LGBT seniors. We've got social groups, we've got all this uh, LGBT bereavement groups, caregiving groups, things like that. And then COVID came and overnight, everyone was back, you know, we're starting from zero again because this community is dealing that one of the challenges is social isolation. And now everyone was shut in, the whole world was shut in. So we had to figure out 
how to get all these people reconnected again and trying to, I had a full head of hair before this, before trying to teach a whole group of, of older adults how to use Zoom and computers and webcams. And, but we did it, we started small, we kept, we kept working and working, trying to get more people. And what, what our success was, I, I tr trained a small group of, of older adults and then got them so that they could reach out to different circles. And it was, that was the, the missing link was having older adults training other older adults, because when it was a younger person, they would just be too embarrassed to say, I don't know how to do this. I'm, you know, can't figure it out. And they just wouldn't do it but they felt okay to ask another older adult, like, I don't understand, where is the microphone? What do I do? I'm lost. And so that was really helpful. And then uh, through Eastern Bank, we got um, some funding to get other uh, uh, tablets to get to people that didn't have access and ended up seeing a lot of those folks were folks that were visually impaired that had a really hard time trying to see on a little phone or something like that. So, so that's where, that's where that, that came through. E even those of us who can wear glasses to do correction, those little screens on phones are not all that user friendly. No, no, no. So, as Vermont tries to look at how to be supportive of our LGBTQ plus elders, do you have suggestions as yeah. to how to develop resources what what were the things that worked really well for your aging project and what are the things that we might want to avoid right good questions um so i i, I think that one of the things to avoid is the feeling like you've got to do it alone because you don't you know you're surrounded by supports and resources and and I think that the, one of the most important things is to connect exactly as we did here, as, as much as you can following the model of what was done uh, in places where it has been successful, but to, to engage with your existing elder care network in Vermont, come to those agencies and, the, um, uh, and, and work with them. And, and I, I think most, they, every one of, every old, older service agencies are, are mandated to serve all the people in their communities not just white people, not just whatever, affluent, everyone, everyone, including gay, straight, ev everyone. So they, every elder service agency also has to do um, uh, a needs assessment and do a plan for X number of years in some agencies, it's five years, 10 years, whatever. Um, and they need to look at all the different subpopulations in the area. So the more that in Vermont, you can get into those to individual agencies because then if they can create programmings out of your senior centers, your local senior centers and councils on aging, then there's stuff happening right there and that people don't need to go to the bigger cities or anything and drive, drive somewhere. And what is often, especially when you're talking rural areas, there may not be a huge population in one particular corner of, of Vermont, but if, if you do a regional programming where five different communities ba band together and there, there is a, each one takes on a different week and you're like, we're gonna do, we're gonna have this regular coffee hour at this senior center on the first Monday. And then the second Tuesday, we're gonna be over here and there's a game night at such and such. So you've got things that are right in your area. So you don't want people driving more than 15, 20 minutes or whatever like that to, you know, out of the way. I think the other thing that's going to be very interesting is that we, I don't think there's, after COVID-19, there's going to be, there's no turning back for this whole online thing. So where our biggest project right now that we're working on is a virtual LGBTQ senior center. So I think programs will always be, have, an, have a hybrid model. There'll be in-person op options and there'll be there'll be virtual options too, because hello, we're in New England, like the weather's, the winters here are a disaster at, at times, especially for people that don't wanna be out at night or don't feel comfortable driving in bad weather. If I get three flakes of snow, half the people from our meal sites will say, I can't go out, can't, can't make it, you know? <laughs> yeah, and you're saying that on a day when we're encountering wind chills of 20 to 30 below. Yeah. So the concept of going outside is not that appealing. No, so what if you had the option to do one thing differently, 
What would that be? Hmm. I'm trying to think of what are the pitfalls I know that we could thing, avoid. Yeah. One thing, one thing is at, from the very beginning, start with a, a, a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. We, when we first came on, it was, there was only white, older gay men there. And, and it took a while to like get, engage the women, to get, engage the legends. And again, once we engaged the women, it was still older white women. So, and it was, it was years into when we realized, how come we don't have any people of color, older LGBT people of color here? So you've got to, from the very beginning, have that commitment to reaching out to all the different populations to make sure they all know they're included umbrella, you know, that, you know, gender diverse, transgender, all, all of these communities need to be there from the very beginning. Um, and then you had asked earlier about the, the, the housing, you know, one of the housing pieces. And I know yeah. you've seen some of my articles. I don't know if you, I don't know if you saw the one about the, where I was kind of making the joke about what we can learn from the Golden Girls. Did you see that article? No, I didn't. I'll have to look for it. So, so one, and this is again, shows the importance of having a connection with these, these aging service access points or ASAPs that we call, I'm not sure if in Vermont they call them ASAPs or not. Um, but they, one of the things that a lot of these, uh, the, the aging service access point is they're responsible for all the older adults in their catchment area. And there is such a big push. We're, we're finally trying to turn away from like, the, the, the days when nursing home was the only option, like that needs to be last resort now. So there is much more of a, a, a demand to age in place. And so that becomes challenging when you think about, um, when, you, when you think about people that are aging you know, by themselves, which is so many of our community do, are, are aging by themselves because they're, they're not partner, they don't have children, they don't have grandchildren. Uh, and many are estranged from their families or distant from their family. So you, we, we've lost 80% of the caregiving right there. So, so what many of these ASAPs here are doing are doing these aging in place models. So we have one right here where I am called JP in, in, in J Jamaica Plain and it's called JP at Home. And so it is basically all the network of different homes and together they the, through the, the agency vets out different providers and things like that and support services and meal, you know, meal delivery and um, home care and house cleaning and things like that. So people can age right in their home and the services are shared between all the people in those different communities. Um, and so, so I think that it, it's, it's important to think about that when you, when you, and what I was saying about the Golden Girls model is, you know, that's wonderful that you've got all those women aging there, but that's horizontal caregiving. Those were all, we only saw the happy side of it, but we never saw the time where there was, you know, two hip fractures and, you know, other, someone was going through chemotherapy. Like, what if all four of them are down and they're all aging, how they support each other, but to be, to be able to age in place in your own home and be supported by an agency to know that they're looking out for you. They can send people over to shovel. They can get the groceries delivered. They can, so, so these things are in, important. And if you want to, um, if we can come in and do some talks with some of the aging service leaders in your area, happy to do that. Uh, for you know, with the aging project, happy to come in and give talks about how you kickstart this and get this going because you you can't wait. You really, you really can't wait. This is our our current our current population. Sorry, our current population of of seniors. Um, you know, we need to make sure that they are taken care of. So and they've got resources. Yeah. And with that, I need to say thank you for spending this time with us. Yeah. I definitely will get in touch to talk about training because that's also been a priority for us here is ensuring that those people from within the mainstream organizations who are providing services get that type of cultural awareness training that they know where to go and where not to go. Yeah. So with that, thank you. You're very welcome. Thank anytime, you. anytime. It was a pleasure. I'm okay. going to keep you to that. Okay, you got it. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm here with Cindy Watson, CEO of Jasmine in Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, Jasmine stands for Jacksonville Area Sexual Minority Youth Network. Thank you, Cindy.
Thank you, Anne. It's delightful to be here. It's wonderful to have you. And before we start, I want to shout out to our mutual friend, Ra Rachel Desolates, who's an ally of the show and of all things good and an activist in her own right. So she brought the, she brought us together for this interview. So hi, That's Rachel. Great. Hi, Rachel, who's been a friend of mine for over 30 years. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Rachel's a real powerhouse. Um, she truly is. I'd like to start by reading your bio, and, which is from the website. And the website will appear periodically as we talk. Um, and then we can go from there. Cindy started her career as a community organizer in Arctic Alaska, helping native Inupiaq women claim their right to safety and freedom from domestic violence and sexual assault. Are you from Alaska? No, I grew up in South Carolina. <laughs> well, there we go. Uh, she honed her, her leadership skills in Vermont in the 1980s when she served as executive director of a rural women's center as champion for women's safety, economic advancement, family and social support. Her work in Northeast Florida has spanned over 25 years and includes advocacy for legal justice, health access, and child safety with Jacksonville Area Legal Aid, followed by her role as founding board member and eventually the CEO of Jasmine, where she holds the vision and guides the resources to realize Jasmine's dream of creating a better world for LGBTQ young people. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, um, it's, uh, it's been a, an inspiring journey, um, you know, working with a lot of different um, marginalized populations, but this work at Jasmine really is close to my heart as a lesbian. You know, it's always been um, kind of a, an important, um, piece of work for me. Tell us a little about your time in Vermont. How long did you live here? So I came to Vermont in 82 um, and was here about eight, about nine years, uh, or was in Vermont about nine years. Um, I uh, came from Alaska and, um, you know, I had been in Alaska for a couple of years as a VISTA volunteer. So that was my work um, in the Northwest Arctic. Um, in Vermont, I uh, very quickly I connected with the Umbrella Women's Center and um, just met the most uh, dynamic, powerful, brilliant group of women uh, in the Northeast Queendom who were doing great community work in response to all kinds of women's issues. Um, so that was a privilege for me to serve in that role as the uh, executive director. It's how I met Rachel. Uh, I met a lot of really great folks. Uh, and I learned, and I learned so much in Vermont about community organizing, about building community, about really listening um, to what women need and what people need. One of the projects that we took on was um, working to raise the, the issues and needs for lesbians in the community. And that was in the 80s. So that was, you know, that, that was uh, pretty new. Um, we had a really a powerful community group that guided that process. We did um, workshops, we talked, we did advocacy. Um, and actually at, at some point we hosted um, a training that Outright Vermont presented in St. Johnsbury to a group of folks in the community. And that's how I learned about Outright. And I really um, began to understand how important it was to work with young people who are LGBTQ um, to, to really provide those supports because um, young people uh, can be very much more vulnerable um, when when facing bias and and oppression and rejection. And so, uh, you know, that planted a seed for me in Vermont, um, one of the many seeds that I brought to Florida. How did you happen to move to Florida and found <laughs> Jasmine? Well, I got um, uh, in Vermont. I met my uh, now partner Garnett. And um, she was from Mississippi. I was from South Carolina. And at some point we said, you know, we're, we're born Southerners and there's a lot of work to do in the South. And maybe we need to move back South and do some of this work. 
Um, so it was a very intentional decision. Um, you know, we came, uh, Garnet's an attorney and uh, now practices law in Georgia. So we, we wanted to be in that sort of Georgia, Florida area. And we landed in, um, we had friends in St. Augustine in a women's community called the Pagoda. So we landed at the Pagoda for a few months uh, and then eventually settled in Jacksonville. Um, and within the first year, I was working at Legal Aid, but I began uh, to volunteer with a group of folks, young people and adults who were creating Jasmine. They wanted to create safe space for, for gay and lesbian youth. They were running um, support groups in the public library and really decided at some point that the young people in Jacksonville needed more than one hour a week in the public library. They needed a lot more support. They needed to do a lot more work in the community. Um, and so that's when I really got involved and helped to incorporate the organization. So, you know, the, the articles of incorporation were signed in my living room, you know, mm -hmm. on coming out day in 1994. And uh, we marked that as our sort of launch to do this bigger work. Um, I have to tell you, when I first got to Jacksonville, I really did not like it. It was such a hard transition from being from Vermont um, for so many reasons. But, you know, Vermont just has such a... Um, such an engaged and sweet spirit when it comes to doing social change work uh, that was not present in St. Johnsbury, but I, I mean, in St. and in Jacksonville. Um, but I got, um, I got inspired. I really just figured out if I wanted to do social change work in the South, Jacksonville, Florida was a great place to do it because there was a lot to be done. Um, and so I, I just dug in my heels and began to organize and uh, created now after 25 plus years, we've created this amazing community organization that's very well known and regarded um, well. And, you know, it was really, we have a place at the table in a, in a medium sized Southern city to, to address, um, you know, LGBT and, um, issues around racial equity and justice um, and health justice. We do a lot of work in the health space. So we, we're we're doing some really great work, yeah, with young people. And now you have a budget of $2 million and 22 staff members and you serve <laughs> 100 youth a year, is that true? Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah, we've, yeah, we've really- Beginnings. Yeah, we, we have really grown, um, you know, a lot, uh, a, a lot of changes started to happen um, uh, when marriage equality came through, you know, when we finally, as a LGBTQ community, got marriage equality and then Florida finally opened up. <clears throat> I think that really gave um, uh, the space, created the space for a lot of people who were supporters and allies to really come forward <clears throat> and step out and become engaged and invest in this kind of work. Um, and so it's been those really big investments that have made, um, you know, made the difference over time. Well, one of the common interview questions these days is, how have you been responding to the pandemic? It's been a major adjustment, I imagine. You have three buildings and a lot of, you had, you had a lot of walk-in services and tell us right. how you... Yeah, so before before COVID, we had just we had just opened our third building, which is dedicated to responding to youth experiencing homelessness. Um, so many of our young people, um, particularly youth of color and particularly uh, those with HIV, uh, are rejected by families and end up being on the street or are very unstably housed and bouncing around. So we had just opened this beautiful renovation of a hundred year old building. Um, to be a welcome center, the front door for, and to a way for young people to come in, to connect, to get basic needs, and also to link to all the other services in town with real advocacy by our care coordinators. Um, so when, when we had to shut down for the pandemic in the middle of March, we, we really, everything had to shut down as I'm sure happened um, in Vermont and everywhere else. Um, but we maintained the youth the youth center for youth experiencing homelessness we kept that open uh for for several hours a week so that young people would be able to get hygiene um uh, we have showers there and would be able to to stay clean if they're on the streets or unstably housed and we could 
give them hot meals and help them get connected. So we got several youth off the streets during the during that immediate shutdown and into hotels um, so they could be safe. Um, you know, we've uh, since then, I think in May, we began to open up with clinical services because we do a lot of sexual health services and HIV testing and we offer PrEP and several of those kinds of um, services. So we were able to reopen some of those very slowly and carefully. Um, the only thing we have not been able to reopen yet are our youth center group kinds of programs. And we do a lot with high school students. Um, they have they have um, their uh, gender and sexuality alliances, their GSA clubs at on school campuses, and we do leadership training and we support them and go to their clubs and work with the teachers and work with the administrators to really make sure that that is a viable um, support system for young people. That has had to pause because schools have not been in operation. When they are, they don't have after school clubs. So we're having to be very creative, like I'm sure Outright and every other organization, um, with our online programming, with our um, with our groups and chats and all those things to stay connected uh, and to be a resource for young people. It's but gotta, it's, it's had a tremendous effect on our on our work. Oh yeah, it's got to be a particular challenge because um, if a youth is homeless, they don't have any internet access. So you can't do Zoom meetings and that. right, right. They don't have stable. Even if they have phones, they don't have stable access, and so there's there's lots of challenges. Yeah, actually, Zoom meetings for for uh, the young people that we work with is it's not it doesn't really work. We we've had to find other ways to connect. We can't wait to be able to fully open our center again. But but um, you know, young people do stop by. We do have certain hours that young people can stop by, and we're very careful about the numbers of kids who can come in, but we have Wi-Fi all over the campus. So, you know, they, there's a lot of, they can, <laughs> they can well, still come and get connected, which is really, really important. Yeah. You are so right. And broadband access is, I don't know if you remember, is a particular challenge in rural Vermont. So some people are really, kind of out of luck during the pandemic. Yeah, you know, we, one of the, one of our, uh, slogans for 2020 was pivot is the new plan and <laughs> because pivot is what we did all year long with every kind of youth service with every fundraising event with every meeting I mean everything had to shift as you I'm sure you well know and um, we have a we have a really strong group of folks who are connected with Jasmine the young people are very resilient and the adults are very committed and dedicated and and so we've been able to um, you know, not just survive, but be innovative and creative and find ways to, to do things differently that are still very, very impactful for young people. What are some of your current projects besides being able to reopen? Forward? Well, we we had a dream to, to add a mental health uh, initiative at the beginning of 2020. We actually had funding and we're ready. And then when when the pandemic happened, we were like, oh my God, how do we do that? But, you know, and uh, mental health issues are so critical. Suicide is, rates are up. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm very worried about young people, uh, as I'm sure, you know, people are worried about a lot of folks because the isolation um, has been so extreme. And then for young people who've had to, who, who are at home, who've had to be housed in places that might not be affirming and safe, you know, there's a lot of depression and, and, you know, even the potential for violence. And so we're really concerned about the impact the pandemic has had on young people's mental health. Um, so we have actually been able to develop um, and, and begin to expand a mental health program that offers some virtual um, counseling, some uh, limited on-campus groups, really small offerings and, and um, you know, some other one-on-one uh, -on -one services. And I'm, I'm really proud of that. As a matter of fact, uh, we have a partnership with Smith College in Massachusetts Whoa. to send interns, <laughs> to send their MSW interns for, you know, for uh, to help to assist with the mental health college. Isn't that, isn't that great? <laughs> That's fabulous. <laughs> You're developing, you have a national profile then obviously too. <laughs> 
we have I, I we have a we have a Jasmine satellites all over the country because when you run a youth center for over 25 years, many young people have come up through that and 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 they're alumni and they've gone on to all kinds of places, and they take you know Jasmine in their heart and you know put in a plug. So we've had we've had staff and youth go to Smith and be in their their graduate programs there. So. You know, like, oh, well, we know this great place in the South. It's called Jasmine and Jacksonville. <laughs> so, yeah, we we do have connections all over the country for that reason. That's fabulous. So what uh, do you have any future goals? Our, uh, our, uh, you know, in addition to just beginning to reopen and really support young people, um, we actually are trying we we have an immediate goal to complete our campus. We have three buildings. They're all over 100 years old. We did a full renovation of the third building, and now we're going back to the, we call them J1, J2, J3. Now we're going back to the first two buildings because they need some upgrades uh, to really round out accessibility and safety, and we need to expand our clinic. And then these three buildings are on a corner, and there's an inside um, sort of a backyard that we have a beautiful plan to turn into a really wonderful campus space and place that young people can, with outdoor classroom, with stage, with uh, a Zen garden, with the kinds of things to round out the experiences for young people. You know, urban youth don't often spend time outdoors in the South. It's too hot a lot of the year and it's too buggy. And then even, and then this time of year, it can be what we think of as chilly. Okay, it's 65 degrees outside right now. So it's, it's sweater day for us people. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm not in my backyard, but this is a picture of my backyard right now. Um, so having outdoor space for young people is so important. That's a, that's a Vermont thing. Being surrounded by green and trees and, you know, breathing fresh air, that is so healing in and of itself. And that's, that's the other piece of this campus completion that we're working on, the safe place. And we, we feel like an organization like Jasmine in a city like Jacksonville is as important a part of the institute is an important part of the social and uh, the fabric of the community as the airport or the library or the school system. There has to be a place for LGBTQ young people, for youth of color, to really feel like this is their space and this is their home, and we can be that beacon of, you know, of, yeah. of pride and celebration for all of them. So I that's what we're going more. for. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. These are worthy. This is such a worthy project. Um, and I hope you'll come back again and tell us more about it as you progress and achieve some of these goals. Before we close out, are there any last words you want to share with the audience? Um, you know, I just, because this is Vermont, I just want to say how really grateful. I am to have to have had the privilege to to live in Vermont and to learn in Vermont and to love in Vermont. It's such a wonderful, inspiring place deep in my heart. And so it's just a thrill to reconnect in any way possible. Um, if there are any old friends that that see this, I'd love to hear from folks. Um, you know, it, it's I carry it with me always. Cindy Watson, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Anne. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you in two weeks, but in the meantime, resist. resist.